Kia ora koutou and welcome to another episode of South Pacific Muscle. Today we've got two guests on, so we've got Tom Shaw, he's just about a regular here. I've got to save that spot in the corner for you there, Tom. Welcome on board, Tom. Good to have you back. Always, always like coming back, it's always a good time. And uh, to see how fast this thing's growing and to be one of the first ones, it's, you know, it was quite a privilege to be on and it's, it's fun just coming back and being a regular. Cool, bro. And we've got Josh Pendley. And so, uh, Mike, I will let you introduce uh, Josh Singh as he's your uh, training partner. I'll start by pronouncing his name right, eh? Josh Pendley. Um, yeah, so uh, Josh competed as a 20, 21-year-old, uh, got a couple of patella tears, took uh, six or so years off, came back about a couple of years ago. I uh, gave him a little bit of help with his first couple of shows and ended up training together. And um, he, uh, I guess the pinnacle so far, because he's still on the way up, is uh, winning the um, overall uh, 2019 yeah. Athletic. So he's Mr. New Zealand, or former Mr. New Zealand now, I suppose. Is this, um, a, is this, and, a, is this a case of the uh, printer becoming the master, or are we still, are we still, still battling on yeah. that one? Uh, uh, when it comes to the lifts, I've still got him on a couple, but he gets me on most of it. So. <laughs> But I'm uh, gaining on you pretty quick, though, eh? So. <laughs> you just out. trying to outsmart him, Mike. Will you, this is kind of... <laughs> see, we've got a, there's, there's a split here, and you guys are sitting at the bottom because, you know, it's this age before beauty sort of thing. So <laughs> under, under 30s, over 40s. <laughs> Look, um, I might take a while to get your name right, Josh. I think um, I've known Anthony <laughs> for eight years, and I keep calling him Anthony, so... Um, I'll try and work on that name. I'm pretty bad on that front. But um, anyway, hopefully I can be a bit uh, more succinct when we talk about progressive overload. Got a bit of reverb coming through. Yeah, Tom's got something playing in the background. Might be me. Hang on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you Amateur. Uh, Amateur. Uh, <laughs> you got the fucking TV on. Yeah. <laughs> 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 might be a bit boring. You want to watch something? Uh, <laughs> 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 it's about progressive overload. So, it's, oh, good shit. It's all, it's all educational, isn't it? You know? yeah, sneak that learning experience in there. Yeah. Hey, look. Um, so today we're going to talk about progressive overload because um, had a lot of questions from people in the gym, like how how do you train and why do you train the way you do. And to be honest, you know, I'm still learning. Um, it's pretty new to me. I've spent probably like Mike, 30 years training the way I've always trained. And um, I decided to try something different. And I guess progressive overload um, is something that I've picked up. And, I, and it, it sat well with me, having been from a strength background, I guess, because, you know, you particularly, you know, you're chasing numbers, you're chasing achievement sort of thing. And the thing I liked about it was the fact that you got reinforcement every workout. In fact, every set that you're doing, you're getting reinforcement or feedback on, on how your progress is going. Um, whereas often I would sort of find, oh, look, you know, this I've got a show and it's in fucking 18 weeks and am I going all right and how am I performing? And I'd have to reach out to others to say, what do I look like? Am I, you know, am I getting there? Whereas this one here, I guess... You know, you, you're getting your feedback from your training, which equates to your performance on stage. So, uh, Tom, I think I've been doing it for oh, three or four months now, possibly a little bit longer. How long have you been working under progressive overload? I mean, I've always been, right back from the start, me and you always had different, um, we had different styles. I would, I've always been around the progressive overload, but I feel like, um, only just in the last, what, 14, 15 weeks of this off-season have I really uh, knuckled down and made sure that there is definitely progression and overload being pushed in, in every session. And yeah. just seeing that and then seeing the progression in physique, density, and also the numbers that are in the gym, it's one of those things that I wish I might have done a lot sooner I hear you, brother. I hear you. Um, we have to make a change. Yeah, I think I've even I've even managed to convince Mike to try and throw a few progressive overload sets in there and start tracking some of those things. So how, how's that? Yeah. Been? Well, I've I've enjoyed it, but I mean, with injuries and bits and pieces, I kind of I've picked uh, an exercise each workout that I'm trying to hit numbers on. 
Yep. And um, yeah, it's all well and good. I've been progressing pretty well until today's leg workout when I didn't hit my numbers. And uh, now I'm really disappointed to see it. Oh, well, I did say this uh, back in, what did I say? Was this the first one I did? I said, if I don't hit a number, I'm pissed for the full week until the next mm. week comes round. Now you know the feeling. <laughs> I, I think um, given, you know, you, you sat in the car for eight hours, you know, in between that workout, probably had a bit of an impact on it. Yeah, um, you know, the nutrition wasn't perfect. Um, I allowed myself to have a couple of bourbons on uh, Friday night with uh, the people through there. I made a burger and fries for lunch. So, you know, there's, there's contributing factors there, but... <laughs> Mitigating circumstances. Yeah, perhaps. We'll see, we'll see next week. Right. Hey, um, I guess what we should do um, is probably um, put up what a typical progressive overload looks like. And I guess we should probably premise this by saying... Um, you know, a lot of this stuff comes out of the UK in the format that we're operating in. And I think um, Jordan Peters, trained by JP, is probably considered the guru, an absolutely meticulous guy when it comes to tracking things and progressing, whether it means progressing by a pound, you know, putting a pound of extra weight on, you know, to do the same reps or an extra rep. Um, you know, he is absolutely meticulous around it. And um, Tom obviously trains under um, Jordan Peters and I'm training under Jamie who trains under Jordan Peters. So I'm one step removed. I kind of thought about it earlier. I was thinking like, um, it's a bit like those Shaolin Kung Fu movies and you always want to get close to the source because they've got the, the best secret. So that's why I've got Tom on because he's, he's close to the source. So he may have some, uh, some insights that I'm missing. Right, I'll bring up a, uh, a training split. Hey, so, yeah, we're talking about people not necessarily understanding progressive overload. I think most people in the gym know they have to progress and know they have to push harder and know they have to have some form of progressive overload. The difference with what you guys are doing is it's very, very prescriptive. And there's numbers you want to hit every workout. So yeah. most people go and go, like, I've got to go harder, I've got to improve every workout, I've got to get stronger. But I guess you guys are really taking it to that sort of end degree to kind of make sure yeah well, make the, sure the workloads the the thing so like saying that um with people going in and just saying oh, i've got to go harder it's well how is that measurable mm. that's the thing so that's i think the, the the biggest key difference with how me and nate are now doing it is it's measurable because you could go in the gym and say oh, i trained harder today but you trained harder on how you felt that day you could have, the week prior, you could have had more energy. You you know, having those numbers in that that book of saying, okay, it's either one rep more or at least a pound more. There's no backing down. I don't care how I feel. You know, you're getting in the fucking gym and you're, you're putting it down on that paper. I think uh, that's really where it, people need to understand that saying I'm progressively overloading by just going in the gym and training it as hard as I can, it's not always really equating to that. The way I explained it um, earlier was, um, give me a bit of feedback. Um, the way I explained it earlier was that, um, you know, you can go into the gym and go, I'm going to train harder than I did last time and smash yourself to bits and go, you know, I trained harder. But, you know, there's confounding variables like a couple of bourbons and, you know, et cetera. Um, <laughs> and, and I guess, you're going on how you feel, whereas what we're doing is we're measuring the amount of physical work that we're doing, being, um, you know, the weight versus the, and, the, and the reps, you know, giving a, a total outcome. And, and our aim is really each workout to be doing a higher amount of work than the previous workout. And that's our measure, I guess, when we, when we look at that. And um, you know, some people are really good at reading their body and, and, and therefore, you know, going in and, and just training and going, I know I trained harder that day, you know, but for us, I guess it's, it gives us a real clear measure. There's no two ways about it. We either did more work in total or we didn't. And you can measure that by each set, you know, on my second yes. drop down set, I did worse than last week. Okay. So last week I did better in that set. Um, so, you know, it's immediate feedback on that. And I guess it acts as a bit of a G up because when I miss one of those sets, I think, fuck, well, I've got five more fucking sets to go and I'm going to make sure I fucking get them in all of those. So, 
to be and to be clear, the form needs to be perfect. Or well, the form needs to be consistent. Because if you if you lift more, like today I was squatting and I got my first set and my second set instead of eight, I got six. Now my knees were starting to buckle in and I was sort of taking stress off my quads. I could have probably pushed out those two more reps with shit form and using my lower back, but I just went, you know, that's not the way I want to perform those reps. Yeah, so but, yeah, we've got to have consistent form. And there's yeah, a tendency, I think, especially for beginners to go, right, if I've got to hit that number, I don't care how I hit it and the form can go. So, you know, there's a balance between making sure you up that workload and, and, and hit those numbers by keeping the form what I, what I'd say is that we, you know, we're not crossfitters, we're, we're bodybuilders, so, you know, it's not a question about moving weight for weight's sake. Muscle doesn't know what the number is on the weight. And, you know, to get an extra rep by, you know, moving your body forward towards the weight or, or using momentum, you just cheat yourself. So I notice that sometimes, you know, I've been working on the same template now for three or four months and some exercises, I feel like I'm getting closer to a ceiling. And um, sometimes I'll sort of look at the weight and think, you know, my form's starting to break down a bit and I'll make a note of that in my book and the next week I'll actually drop down and wait and move up and rep range and pull that form back in and then work my way back up again. There's a couple of different um, uh, uh, methods to intensify that, right? Because you can increase the weight, um, you can increase the volume, the number of reps. So you might keep the weight the same, but you might look at doing 12 reps as opposed to 10 reps next yep. week or you can increase the density of the workout so maybe you reduce the the rest period between sets as a bodybuilder what would be your main priority it would be the weight My, mine to be honest is I, I treat weight and reps equally and i'll show you what i mean when we look at our templates so you know to me going up in weight and doing the same reps as i did with a with a lighter weight or using the same weight and getting an extra rep a win's a win for me because it's more work i'm doing um I use intensifying techniques somewhat and I don't use them very often and I think that that's probably coming in the future for me. I don't think that I'm, you know, I'm progressing well enough as it is so I don't need to do a lot of drop sets. I don't need to do, you know, cluster sets, all that kind of thing. Um, I don't need to have forced reps. I actually don't have a spotter so I train by myself. So I guess question could be asked, could I be doing more if I had someone that was lifting out to me and, and giving me that confidence that, you know, I could push that a little bit harder and closer to, to the edge. So, yeah, um, I don't use any of those techniques really other than uh, I think a couple of exercises in, the, in, the, in that two-week rotation have, um, has, have some rest pause stuff in it, but that's about it. What about you, Tom? Uh, so... On almost, I know on every on every push day and every pull day, I've got a rest pause. But mine follows very similar to yours. It's um, not just one rep range for the whole for the whole workout. It's JP's mentality is to get strong in every rep range. So uh, on days, my rep ranges will vary from six to seven, uh, eight to ten, twelve to fifteen, fifteen to twenty. So there's in one workout, you have every single rep range that's there. Um, there's also other ways of, in, you know, intensifying sets. Like we said, rest pause sets where, you know, you're pushing past and you're just doing those extra last that you couldn't. But there's also, I don't know about you, Nate, but in mine, I'm uh, stru uh, my structure for my reps is a three second eccentric. So a negative motion is always a, a really great way if you're moving that heavy weight to add that extra bit of intensity to it because you're still activating muscle tissue whilst performing that set. So you don't have to necessarily do extra sets because you're still going to get more breakdown. You're pushing that, that ceiling of, instead of just, you know, a ratio of two, uh, zero, two, zero, two, yeah. you're going up and down. If you add a two and then a zero four and you're coming down for four seconds, you're putting more strain in that motion. Yeah. And that's, I think, where I'm seeing the most improvements is like we're saying form always strict. So like JP would say, lock in the moment I'm in, I lock in and I'm working on everything in that set to give my all on all ranges. And that's me. That's my set done. So I think that's, that's really something that instead of 
dropping rest times down, I think it's something that might be a little bit overlooked is actually your timing ratio of your rep. Yeah. Look, um, last week, uh, Jamie had a chat to us all and said, um, you guys need to look at your tempos. And he said, I want you doing three, one, three. And I was like, holy shit, three, one, three. And then I realised he was talking to the guys that were in lockdown because they didn't have a lot of weight. So I was thinking, oh, we don't have to do three, three, one, threes. Um, but um, I haven't had a lot of focus on tempo, but I think it's because I'm kind of new to the game. Um, you know, I think that when I give um, feedback that, look, I'm not progressing anymore in these lifts, then he'll say, back your weight off, let's play with some tempos. Something like that. He'll make some change, and I'm assuming tempos will come into it. I did a lot of that stuff with the um, MY40, uh, Ben Pikowski stuff. Um, he did a lot of, you know, every set had a tempo associated with that set. So I'm very aware of that. And I remember having like seven, two, three, and you kind of like, oh, yeah. even second negative, you know, but, um, and, and breaking that um, stretch reflex by pausing at the bottom for three and stuff like that. So um, I think, I think I'm, you know, on the, I guess, the novice uh, progressive overload. And once I start, you know, hitting some, hitting that ceiling where I'm not getting um, a lot of PRs, because at the moment, say, for example, I probably have between 8 and 15 um, targets that I need to beat each workout. And at the moment, I'll probably only miss two or three of those in any given workout. So my progress is still going really well. And I wondered how long you could keep doing that for. And um, I heard JP talking, and he was saying that he could stay on a template for up to seven months and still progress without having to, you know. So, you know, I guess... Um, you know, do, you guys, do you guys feel that um, once you get to a certain level of strength, that you're pushing enough weight or putting enough load through those muscles with sets that are short of failure or just to failure rather than beyond? Because for beginners, I mean, I, I, I'm not very strong. So sometimes I feel like if I'm, you know, benching 60 or 80, it's not really doing enough. And it's only those really heavy sets or going past failure or whatever on those sets. Uh, or you're doing, doing some intensifiers that kind of pushes my intensity up to kind of stimulate that muscle enough. Whereas if you're benching, you know, three, four plates, then even those three, four plate, you know, pr uh, activator sets or um, oh. beginner sets are kind of uh, are putting a fair amount of load on the muscles. I don't a think... Little a little relative how strong you are. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it's relative. I mean, if you bench... If your max bench is 80 kilos or your max bench is 300 kilos and you're pushing yourself to failure each set, you know, just on that last rep that you can do, you're still, both of you are both pushing that, t that muscle to the, to the limit because it's, it, it, I guess it's relative to the person. I don't know. Tom, you got any thoughts on that one? I think, yeah, it's relative. I mean, like you're saying, an, a, a beginner, because th in, no, in no way in this conversation that we're having here, am I saying to someone who's first year in the gym, go out and lift as heavy as possible because they don't, you don't realize how long some of us have been training and we've got the knowledge and we've got the, the moment the down. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. when you don't have that, that's the, that's the prime example of someone hurting themselves. And that's not what I'm trying to say here. Yeah. Um, for people who it's their first year and 60 kilos is their max for a bench. Uh, as opposed to someone, you know, who's like uh, James Holling said, uh, who can bench five, six plates. I think it's all to do with the person. You're both taking yourself to absolute failure. So the weight is just relative to the person. It doesn't matter if you're a novice and you're new. Don't look at someone who's been training 15 years and go, I have to be that strong this quickly because we all took a very long time to get there by making sure we had the fundamentals and the load being put in the right place and exerting the right amount of force before we started playing with the, the poundages. Yeah. I guess that question is more relevant when you're looking at the uh, other side of where you're using more intensity techniques and using feeder sets on the way up, that those feeder sets become a little bit less productive. I feel are like a bit more productive if you're 
still short of your maximum, but lifting a significantly heavier weight. So I mean, it's not really... The, the feeder sets are very, very new to me. I didn't even know what a feeder set was until 14 weeks ago. I was very much in that mindset of uh, you came in, you did your your reps, you kept progressing up, kept progressing up, and you hit your two hot top sets. Either that was two that pyramided on top, so heavier and heavier, or one heavier and then a back off. Uh, mm-hmm. And I have to admit that if I didn't have the nine years prior knowledge, doing those feeder sets that I'm, like JP recommends that my feeder sets move into my top set so I don't exert too much energy is two reps just to Mm -hmm. lock in and feel it. And even now for me, that's still quite hard to actually get my head around that my body is warm enough and the two's fine. Then another one, a singular rep and continue. So there's so many different things that are involved in it. And I feel like even now we're, we're still all learning. And there's always different ways to intensify. And for a new person, there's going to be different ways to intensify as opposed to someone like uh, you, Mike, or me, or Nate, who have been training for a very long time. And we know what works for us to intensify. or We know that little bit more. So it's all just everyone will find it as they go. It's interesting. What does the warm-up period look like for uh, if, you're, if you're preparing for a heavy set like... Uh, Tom, when you go into the gym, how how much time and effort is spent into the the preparing yourself for the heavier sets? And are there times when you'll you'll go to the gym, uh, you'll warm up a little bit, and you feel like that 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 just wasn't enough to prepare you, or maybe you've sort of exerted too much energy, and now you feel like you can't sort of push yourself and get the optimum uh, result? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So um, I know it sounds really really cliche. But when I get in the car, that's when I start preparing myself for the, because my sessions now are 12, 13 exercises long. So there's 26 working sets that need to be done that all need to be executed a certain way with the same intensity from start to finish. So I'm, I prepare before I get to the gym. And there are days where I might take nine or 10 feeder sets and just one singular rep here and there, or I might take a little bit longer, especially on push day. Um, I'm very, very weary over my shoulders and my chest. Uh, I have torn my chest before, so it's one of those things that I like to make sure is is warm. So I might spend a little bit more time warming rotators up, doing some fly motions and moving into it. But it's definitely one of those things that, for me, um, how a standard one would look, um, a lightweight I'd do for 10 to 12, then eight, then six, then three or four, and then two, one, one, and then I would go for that set. And if I feel like, okay, I'm a little bit spent from those those feeder sets, every rest period is not timed. It's a rest period of you rest until you can give for that set. So it's one of those things like if on leg day, for instance, leg day, uh, my hack squats, I have the ratio I've got to do a three second eccentric, a two second pause and then up and you've got to push some poundage in that. So it, some, some days if I'm feeling it, it might be three minutes, some days it might be five, but it's, I give myself the adequate time to be able to continue to, to push that, that exertion that the internal stimulus needs to be pushed. So it's just that time that I need. Is that feeling like to see the feeder sets that we talked about, the feeder sets we talked about were um, quite familiar to me being a powerlifter because what you would do is you would always, you know, think about, you know, on this particular day, we're going to do three rep benches or four, you know, so when you're going for those numbers, you've got to be warm, but you can't be taxed. And that's what feeder sets really are. So, you know, like a good example would be, you know, if I was going to do RDLs, right? So I'd go in and I'd put 60 kilos and I'd pull eight reps. Then I'd chuck on 100, I'd pull four, put on 140, I'd pull two. Um, then go, you know, 160 or 180, whatever it is, pull one. And then I'd just go to my working set and do a six to eight rep set, you know? So my idea is just to get a feel for the weight as well as being warm. Um, and the further through my workout I get, 
you know, on the later sets um, in my workouts, I often don't do any feeder sets. Most of the time, I'll use, for most exercise, I'll do two towards the end, one feeder set, sometimes none, just depending how the body's feeling. Um, and depending on what exercise it is, you know, some exercises, <laughs> as you get older, you need to do a few more, um, you know, and I might do a few more, you know, a few more, a double with a single moving up to it. But, um, you know, it's not like the old, right, to, today I'm going to go and, you know, I'm going to do my working set at 100, but I'm going to do eight reps on, on 80. You know, you just wouldn't do that. You'd do two on 80. So but what I'll do is I'll pull that template up so we can see, share what we're actually talking about. Okay, so what I've done is I've just put together um, basically two weeks of training and I've put my training up top and then Tom's underneath and as you can see, my split is I do a push day, I do a pull day, have a day off, have an arm day, have a leg day, have a day off and then I repeat. However, I have two different rotations. So the first, first six days training is different for the second six days. So then I carry on into my second rotation. And at day 12, I'm doing, day 13, I'll be doing the same push workout as I did on day one. Tom's is a little bit um, shorter, which means he trains more frequently than me. So he does a push, pull, off, legs, off. Um, and then, That's because he's 20 years younger than you. He recovers quicker. <laughs> no, it's because... <laughs> Because he's got arms, I have to spend the whole day doing arms. It's like a 12-hour workout. Um, so what um, you can see is that in um, two rotations for me in 12 days, whereas Tom knocks that out in 10 days. And if you have a look on this one here, what you can see is I've circled uh, push workout on, on the Monday in yellow for me. When I get to the Saturday of the following week, that's the workout I'll be doing exactly the same workout as I did on the Monday. So what I do is I get to my diary, I flick back to the Monday, and I have a look at all the um, sets that I did, and I know that that's what I've got to target in terms of doing an extra rep or putting the weight up. Tom would do the same. Um, uh, he only has to go back 10 days, so he's, he actually has to beat targets more regularly than what I do. I think I just need some more. I've got, a, I've got a question in there. The the fact that you're using two rotations, does that mean potentially in your second rotation you're gaining some strength or growth, but not trying to hit the first rotation's numbers? So by the time you get to the get round to the first rotation again, you've actually had two workouts on that muscle group. So that will be a better chance of kind of being stronger and making beating those numbers. I guess if you look at it in the way that I do, because I come from that, you know, the strength training background, I think the second rotation is almost like assistance work for the first rotation and vice versa. The first week is assistance work for, for the second week. So because you're using, doing slightly different exercises, which also increase your strength, but, you know, they assist you when you come to go back 12 days in my case or Tom look back 10 days. Tom, your thoughts? I don't think of it as uh, the second one is something to help the first one. I think the second one is enough, another way of just fucking yourself up um, and just killing it. Another one. Um, to be honest, I, with the way that the, the programming is, with you would think having two so close together and running that many rotations, you would think that you're, you would take a really long time to recover and you wouldn't be able to progress. But it's actually astonishing how fast y you, you move up. Um, I mean... I've been moving up. So if I do push on rotation one uh, and push on my second rotation and I go absolutely balls to the wall on the first one and the second one, I hit new numbers every single week. And most weeks at the moment, it's been 10 kilo jumps. And it's been the week prior, the way that I did the week prior felt like nothing the following week. And I've had to go 10 kilos up and I'm actually looking at my book and going, okay, that's not a normal progression jump. What is yeah. going on? Yeah. I'm killing myself twice in 10 days. How am I actually moving this much? But I think really it's the frequency side of things. And I don't think one is a let off from the other. I think one is just a different way. Yeah, so I wasn't, I wasn't trying to suggest that one rotation was more important than the other. I mean, rotation one 
helps your strength so that you can beat your rotation two numbers from the previous rotation. But having something, if you did this, if you did one rotation twice, you'd be trying to hit those numbers five days later with the same exercise. What you're doing is hitting some, trying to hit some numbers from 10 days previously where you've had more time to essentially get stronger and grow because you've trained that muscle group once in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, 100%. I wasn't. Uh, hey, Tom, uh, yeah. um, interesting point. You said that, um, you know, some, some days you kind of have these massive jumps, and I had that today. Like, you know, so on my um, previous week, I was doing hacks, and I think I. You know, I, I only got one extra rep with, I put, I put a one and, a one and a quarter kilo on each side. So I, I, I did one extra rep with two and a half kilos on a hack squat, which is absolutely pathetic, you know, using nickels and dimes instead of the big dollars. But then uh, this week I was doing, um, I think I was doing uh, hip thrusters of all things. But I jumped, I jumped 10 kilos and did two extra reps. I thought, oh no, one extra rep, but with ten, another, a 10 kilo jump. And that's after three months of steadily improving on an exercise I'd never ever done before. Um, but it's interesting that some weeks, you know, you'll, you'll get one extra rep or you'll get two and a half kilo gain or, you know, whatever it is. And then other weeks you just have these big kind of leaps and it's, it's the progression isn't always... You know, and sort of go, yeah, absolutely, not linear. Yeah, it's um, some weeks it will be like it's not all sunshine and rainbow. Some weeks it will be you, you've got to claw for that one extra rep on a weight, and you may still come away from it angry at yourself, like, you know, why didn't I get the same jump as the week before? Um, but I feel that's just normal. I feel some weeks there are so many variables like Mike saying, you know, driving eight hours, having an alcoholic beverage or having a meal. There are so many variables that equate to performance output. Yeah, and some yeah. weeks you might not get as much sleep as you did the week prior. And you might not have had enough water because you might have been rushing around. I think there are so many things in, in those variables that affect that. So, yeah. that's probably why we see those jumps one week as opposed to another. It might be, oh, we just have yeah. I guess it's kind of similar to um, when you're dieting and, you know, your fat loss doesn't come off at half a kilo every week. Sometimes you lose a kilo and a half. Some weeks you kind of, your weight almost goes up, you know, and it just, it, for some rhyme or reason, you know, the body uh, is in a perfect machine. Well, not in a perfect environment, I guess. Um I thought it might be useful if I put a um, typical workout up. So I just put one of mine and it is just what it is. Um, so I do, um, on one, one of my rotations, I do a chest dominant push day. Um, the other one I do a delt dominant push day. And, and there's not a lot of difference really in them, except one's slightly more focused on, on delts, but, but not a lot. There's not a lot in it. So the way I approach it. Um, and I do the same for any, you know, push, pull, legs, arms, whatever. Um, I always start with an activation exercise. And that's typically for me with about 50% sort of weight. You know, it's, it's, it's reasonably lightweight. But by the third set, it's really freaking burning. And I actually sometimes find out the hardest exercises of the day because you're really concentrating on full range of motion, massive contraction just to get as many fibers firing and making sure you're warm as well but also it's it's really about recruiting fibers i think um so that's my take on the activation exercise you're not trying to progressively overload so the weight i do on my cable crossovers is the same weight i did 12 weeks ago it is it just it doesn't change it's not about the weight however the rest of the um exercises as you can see there in the style uh, progressive overload for me. So today, um, if I was doing the delt dominant day, I do my cable crossovers, then, you know, it's game time. And I look back 12 days and go, what did I do on lat raises? Okay, I did 20 kilo dumbbells for the set of 10 on my first one. And then I dropped to the 16s and I did a set of 12. So what I do is I'll go, well, if I did... 12, if I only did 10, my, I really need to get to that 12 and, and I'll probably stick on that weight and make sure I've got 12. So um, 
in that one there, it's not probably a typical um, exercise for me because you can see with the preceding exercises, there's always one um, lower rep and it's generally between 6 and 10, 6 to t- sometimes 12 depending on what body part it is, but 6 to 10 reps and then it's a drop down set and, and by drop down it's not one that you um, you know, you back the weight right off and then get into it, you're still taking as much time as you need to beat that previous um, drop down set and typically say for the shoulder press machine I might have and it, again it'll depend what machines we're talking but you know, if I had three plates aside on on the the um, one that at our gym, and I got eight reps for the first set, then I'd probably drop down to two and a half plates aside and aim for that ten to fifteen rep range. If I'm going, you know, sometimes I'll do a set and I'll get the weight wrong, or I'll, you know, have a really really good set. And instead of getting the 10 to 15 reps in my drop down, I'll do 18 reps. You don't stop in that rep range. You go until you fail. I mean, if you pick a weight and it's too light and you're already committed, you're, you're 12 reps in and you're thinking, fuck, I can get another five. You go for it and then just make a note of it. And then the next week you increase that weight so you don't make that slip up again. Any sort of comment on that, Tom? Yeah, I mean, generally the, the idea is on your progressive overloads that generally for the main exercises and we we'll ignore things like calves and lat raise where you've got, you know, similar sort of things. You, like on the, on the main ones, you've got a heavier set with a lower rep range and then a back off set at where your, your rep range is, is quite a bit higher. So, you know, I guess like you talked about, you're working on getting strong through different rep ranges. So both of those, so I need a, for, um, you know, say shoulder press and machine, there's only two working sets. One's your first up set, next one's your back off set. And both of those sets, you're trying to beat every single workout, so you're looking back. So I guess that's how it goes. Any questions sort of on that stuff, Mike? Uh, one thing that did pop into my head, when you go decide that, you know, you, you'd say you did your 17 reps and go, Okay, I'm going to up the weight next time. What's your, I mean, what's your relationship between load and reps? I mean, obviously you want to get back into that rep range, but I mean, how much are you prepared to kind of back off to kind of increase your reps or load up? I mean, to 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 bring your reps back down again. I'm really sort of an intuitive thing. Well, I'm I'm really determined to improve each week within that rep range if i improve and i go over the rep range i still see it as a win but i think dumb dumb ass you could have done a better choice in terms of the weights um that said like you know i've done some um oh like pec deck's a great example actually i got on the pec deck and our pec deck's a little bit different to most and so i loaded up the weight to what i was sort of familiar with and i was going for um 10 to 12 reps and I only managed to get eight absolutely busting my ass so you know like for me I was a little bit annoyed I probably should have used some feeder sets to work out that hey actually this pec deck's a hell of a lot harder than what I'm used to so it was kind of a learning point for me that if you if you're ever going on to a piece of kit that you're not familiar with you do need to do a few more feeder sets to make sure you're getting 
getting the right numbers. But um, so what I did with that is I just made a note of it. And the next time I used a pick deck there, I knew that that pick deck was quite um, quite hard. So that I failed at whatever the weight was, didn't make the rep range, so I backed it down a bit. And I, that's really important for me, stuff like that, because I travel a lot for work. Um, if you look at my diary on the top of the page, it's got my weight in the morning, and right next to it, it says the gym that I'm training at. So if I look back 12 days and it says Olympic Gym Mosgiel, then and I'm sitting in Flex Fitness Hastings, I can't compare the weights. And so what I'll do is I'll refer back to a previous workout where I was at Flex Fitness Hastings and I went, oh, I did that. Right. And I'll sort of base it on that because in an ideal world, you'd be in the same gym with the same equipment under the same conditions. But, you know, um, for me, that doesn't work in terms of uh, work. So I try to standardize it. I write the names of the machines when I'm away um, next to the exercise so that if I'm ever in a similar gym somewhere else and I've got the same machine, at least I've got a reference point somewhere in my diary. Mm. The, the, you, you both talked about being sort of the rest periods being intuitive as well and going, well, I just take as much time as I feel like I need to kind of beat those numbers. Uh, on a given day where you're feeling good and your kind of your rest step is to be a little bit shorter, or on a day where you beat the numbers by quite a bit, that presumably is going to fatigue you for the next set that you do. And so, if you beat your numbers on your first one, but then you can't beat them on the second one because you've done so well on your first one, or maybe you beat your numbers on your first couple of exercises, but then you fatigue yourself so much that you can't beat them on the others, what's the relationship there? Just just go, just go, the train hard, rip into it. Yeah, and like for me, if I if I hit that top set of six to seven and I smash out heavier than what I did the week before, and then I might drop back to the same to the same weight I did the week prior for my back off set, and I might hit the same reps. I know it's going to annoy me, and I know I'm going to be fucked off for the rest of the session and I'm going to use it in that session. But then when you stand back and you actually look at it and you go, okay, well, I did take yeah. the breath because I exerted more yeah. in that yeah. first step and then I managed to maintain or hold on for that second one. And I think sometimes, I don't know if you guys are the same, but when I'm in the gym and I've got good music on, I've had a little bit too much caffeine prior to the gym and then I hit a couple of good sets, I kind of get carried away and I kind of end up falling into that rhythm of not taking enough time to prepare. Mm. Before that set, I end up falling back into that old routine of let's go, let's go, let's go. We're going to do this and this and this. And then by the time I finish those two exercises, I'm like, well, now I'm fucked. And I've still got 13, you know, 13 more sets to go. So I think it's just... Do you find, Tom, that, um, you know, like you say, sometimes you do a real big um, initial set on one of your bigger exercises and like for me, look, if I hold ground after doing something like that, I actually kind of take it as a win because I, you know, I don't need that time to reflect. I've already worked it out that any gains a game for me because I'm an old man. But um, then later in the workout, you tend to bounce back pretty quickly and it doesn't seem to affect the entire workout. It might affect that one set afterwards. But then when you switch exercises, you're back in the game again and you're looking back and you're going to, you know, you're going to smash that number. There are many times, especially on chest day, or especially on a push day. For me, push day is a big thing. Um, obviously, my chest being my weakest point, I've kind of learned to really get focused on that day. So say if I, in my first two exercises, which are two press motions, if I hit two really, really good sets and then two really good back-on sets, and I might be tired, and the next exercise, I might be, you know, I might have to struggle for it. I feel like that, that boost of, you know, I'm, I'm killing it, I'm killing it. Kind of you hit that second wind. And it's that, yeah. that mindset, that mentality pushes you through and picks you back up. Because there are days when you go in the gym and you might have had a shit day or you might just be tired and it's just not the same, you know, there's no wind in your sail. And, and those lifts you might be doing, but it's not, it's not carrying you the way it would. So I think it is definitely 
there's a there's a big mental thing about that second wind. Once you hit those ones, it pushes you right through. Are you running? Are you in? Are you in um, surplus again, or are you still running deficit calorie wise? Um, still, uh, I think JP wants me still a little bit leaner. Which I'm uh, like, when when will I have more calories again? <laughs> um, no, but it's good. I still feel like if I'm hitting if I'm hitting these numbers in a deficit, well then what's it going to be like with a surplus? I'm on the same page as you because I, you know, I've been in deficit for. 20 plus weeks and I'm getting stronger 90% of my exercises every single session and I'm thinking roll on surplus <laughs> you know like <laughs> you can see why I mean even an average guy that is meticulous about the template that you know is eating every meal and all that you know stuff that's a given for us you can see why they become reasonably strong guys and you can see why genetic freaks like Hollingshead that have had that background doing this are just moving so much weight, it's ridiculous. Because for someone to be dieting for 20 weeks and if I look at my numbers at the start versus now, they're more progression than I would have probably had usually in a surplus anyway. So, and that's, you know, I'm 23, 24 kilos lighter than when I started. So... There's something in it anyway. I mean, when I was what? The heaviest I ever was when I was very untidy. 127. Okay. The numbers I was hitting then to compare to now, yeah. The same thing. Yeah. It's it's very... Um, I think once I do hit a surplus, I'm going to have to be very smart and very careful with just how fast I do move up the weight. Yeah. Because it's got to the point now where everything, there's plates being added to stacks already and it's like just how far can you actually push your body and then you realize that's how these guys like jp says you never see a small strong guy you know you never see a small strong guy all the bodybuilders that are the biggest are usually the strongest yeah when we're talking bodybuilding absolutely hey um are you kind of like like i've found that even probably i mean it's been at least for the last six weeks that and I heard uh, James Hollingshead talking about James Hollingshead talking about it. That when you're on those sets, they're now getting to a point that they're actually a little bit scary. You're like, what, this weight's actually a fucking. You know, I'm really testing myself here. I'm at my limit, and you're kind of riding that fine line, but with the backing of knowing that your form's good, and unless you do something stupid, you're not going to actually tear anything. You're not going to do anything, but there's that little bit of nervousness because the weights are actually getting to a point that you're not comfortable. Not, it's not that you're not comfortable, but there's a little bit of uncertainty, just that little bit that makes it exciting to do. Somewhat exciting. Definitely, like, uh, I'm not going to deny that when I pick up a weight that is, you know, the other week I threw up the 70 kilo dumbbells on, it, on an incline and I've never touched a 70 kilo dumbbell before. And there was a lot of me that was, you know, shitting myself because I was like, fuck, if what happens if I get this up and then I can't get it up and it's like stuck. And then, you know, there's all these variables that run in your head of what's going to happen. But I think it's, it is fun. It is like once you put it down, once you've done it after you've skated yourself and you've actually done the reps, you kind of look at it, you know, I achieved it. Yeah, it's, there's a bit of an adrenaline rush to it, but yep. it is now definitely getting to the point where most exercises it's like well, all right fuck uh it, what's my go-to plan if this doesn't pan out <laughs> <laughs> the eject button yeah exactly drop them and run <laughs> well mike at least mike's got he's got a set of 80 kilo dumbbells down there for you if you ever if you run out of you know you start doing fucking 15 rep fucking on those on those 70s that's the goal eventually. I think that's the goal. And then the other one is to pull a 300 dead by, you know, by July next year. Your you, and Paris and Ryan, you and Paris and Ryan can have a race. No, don't <laughs> even compare me. Do not compare me to Paris because I don't understand how he pulled 300 so easily. Yeah. All right. I was trying to rev up him and Ryan to race to that 350 when Ryan talked about it the other day. <laughs> They're both unusually strong. They're both, yeah. uh, you know, I've said this to both of them. They are both pros just on the cusp. Yeah. 
yeah. very, very close. You know, those two are uh, two guys that when I see Paris deadlift, that, that gets me fired up. It's like, right, this guy is an amateur and he's kicking my ass in deadlifts. I've got to do something about this. Good stuff. Hey, um, right, and Josh, are there any sort of parting questions before we sort of get in, start? Well, oh, sorry, I was, I was going to, I was going to contrast a little bit with uh, progressive overload intensity techniques. We went on for an hour or so already, so we might just leave that for another, for another yeah. chat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. So I've, I've had a good uh, pick of your brains. Not much here today, but. Um, what do you reckon about getting Josh on a fucking uh, progressive overload program and see, see what we can do with him? Oh, I'm actually starting to think about how that would work now for me because uh, for the last sort of three three years that uh, Mike and I have been training together, there's, there's, there's structure, but it's, it's all based around how I feel and I'm quite comfortable training that way. And I think um, the thing with progressive overload is your body adapts to stress and you're constantly stressing your body by by forcing it to lift more and 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 pushing it that way as opposed to using other intensity techniques like I'm quite a big fan of pre-exhausting so I would pre-exhaust my legs before I train so I wouldn't have to lift a lot of weight um, and my legs grew quite well from that but it, it's 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 just another way of stressing um, and uh, yeah the the change the 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 trying something new, I think, is the thing that that uh, you got to get your head around first, eh? Yeah, man. Like you know, like as I say, like I I did the same kind of things for for many years. And I guess I had parallels though because um, I grew up when I was powerlifting doing linear progression programs, and they bored the shit out of me. And then I discovered Westside Barbell and their training, which was radically different. And I went you know what, fuck everyone else, I'm going to give this a go. And I really enjoyed it. So I had a positive experience trying something different. So, you know, that worked for me. And that's probably why I made the jump um, after having trained, you know, 25, 30 years of the same sort of thing. But I think you're right, you know, like it's it's just another way. Because look, the body only adapts if you're putting it under more more stress and more load and all the rest of it. And it's just another way of doing that. But um I really enjoy it. I really enjoy it. And and look, you know, you can you can always play around with like what Mike's doing and just chuck a couple of things in there and yeah. see 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 how you respond. And there's certain I don't know, I mean I like the for me it's probably more that I've got a coach and I have to report to and if I'm not getting targets I have to tell him and I've got a lot of respect for him and I don't want to go, Oh, actually this week I didn't get many PRs because I've never had to do that yet, you know, but every week I'll be I'm smashing them, I'm smashing them. And it, it, it's really nice. And I like the, the constant positive reinforcement because, you know, my little ego needs a bit of stroking and, you know. So to, to some degree, we've been experimenting with lots of different exercises, lots of different angles, lots of different rep ranges and combination of exercises to try and really build that mind-muscle link um, and kind of find the exercise that we feel the best and, you know, that sort of thing. The second side of not using that with Josh and I is that then um, he doesn't get super strong and I can keep up with him. <laughs> uh, yeah. well, you're trying to play me. You're trying to play me. I think um, one of the, the biggest principles that I'm, I'm really into, and it's a little bit like what uh, David Neefy was talking about on the podcast that he was on, the mind-muscle connection is the first thing that you need to try to achieve. Once you've developed that skill of... of contracting the muscle uh, using resistance with your mind and you can feel that and you can feel the muscle contracting under the load then you can start putting weight on top of that there's no point just going to the gym and pressing a ton of weight yeah. if you're not doing it right and I think that's the first thing that you've got to try to get down and and and, and then you can start in, in, in incorporating things like progressive overload and interesting though because like some of those things um, have like some like a bicep's really easy, you know, you, you, you can sit there and, you know, you can contract, you can feel every fibre contracting, etc. But your dominant side lat, you know, like that's taken me only up until recently that I've managed to really get the feel for that. Um, so, you know, some, that my muscle connection, my, my take on that is that, you know, you might get that with, most of your muscle groups um, and some of them to a certain extent but some of them you know like 
like I say, my dominant side from my left. I can. It just took me years, and I'd always be focusing on. It. I'd be like getting someone to poke me in the back down the lower lat and things. So um, I don't know, it, it, but it's certainly something that that we still need to do when we're doing progressive overload, because otherwise we're just throwing weights around for the sake of it, you know. And and that's it. Like if you, if I think if you had the tendency to be a sloppy trainer and you went on to progressive overload, it'd just be a rep- recipe for disaster. You'd be you'd be tearing things left, right, and centre just by trying to push your weight up. But you have to be quite religious. If you haven't got a training partner in terms of being religious about your form, if you've got a training partner, they'll just tell you that you fucking look like a fucking idiot. Well, JP, JP talked about internal load and external load. So the external load, the, the weight you've got to, to move. But then if that doesn't increase the internal load on the muscle, then there's no point in increasing that external load. I mean, the whole objective is the to put more internal load or put more stress on the muscle. Absolutely. So that's how you do it with good form. Yeah, that's a, we're not doing weightlifting competitions, you know, move the weight at all costs, so, yeah. Right. Sorry, Tom. I think the two, if anyone's watching this who's a beginner, the two most important things for anyone starting up any form of weight training is firstly get movement patterns. That's number one, that's the key movement patterns, and then my muscle connection. Everything after that comes. Those are the two that you need to work on the most. Mm-hmm. Like, like all of us are saying, there's still things that we're, you know, still learning to do 100%. And if someone may have told us this, you know, when we started, we may have more, um, we may have achieved more muscle, those kind of things. Mm-hmm. So I think it's very important to stress to people who are starting out to focus on those two before you focus on weight. The weight's always going to come. You don't have to worry about it to start with. Yeah, true, true that. Right, guys, thank you very much for taking your Saturday night to come and uh, talk bodybuilding with me. Um, really appreciate it. Good having you on, Josh. Good seeing you again. Um, can't wait to see you on stage again. Um, it's going to be a very different package this year, so look forward to seeing that. And um, Mike, I'll be down in the needle again at some point, so I'll come catch up. Come, say. Oh, I was going to say... Um, we shout out Olympic gym every now and then, right? And uh, speaking to Gary, and, and he said, oh, I'll give you some free passes. So any of the listeners who are, who are coming to Dunedin who want to uh, train, free passes to the Olympic gym, just give us a shout, uh, contact you maybe through Insta on South Pacific Muscle, Easy. and we'll hook up hook up free pass, come for a workout Olympic. And you, you could just come train, or you can uh, hook up with me or Josh or whatever for a workout. So. Sweet. Right, people, stay safe out there. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we will catch up with you later on in the week. Cheers, guys. See ya. See ya.